Hey everyone, Johnny Rock here to talk about the analog mixing process used on Johnny Rock and Friends for the record. Just a quick primer for those who don't know. Mixing is blending all the sounds you've recorded to create a finished version of a song. You balance the volume, tones, and dynamics of each sound, plus add reverberation and effects. Most of our recordings were done on 2-inch tape, and we decided to mix our songs by hand through analog consoles to 2-track half-inch tape. We also patched in an array of outboard gear, which was a combination of analog compressors, gates, and EQs, plus digital effects units like reverbs and delays. Co-producer John Bross and I originally intended to mix our tapes at an outside studio. Even though the recording chain at Sound Over Sound was really robust, it had been a long time since either of us did an analog mix in that room. Format. It's been a while since I've done it, so we got to kind of get up to speed again, you know? Yeah. We really weren't sure if the equipment was up to the task, and we certainly felt the old Mackie console we monitored through was a weak spot. We have a nice. name for you, Mr. <laughs> John. I actually never I look at it and I think Bessie. I don't know why. That said, after trying out a mix at another studio, John seemed determined that we could do better at home. So he went through every piece of gear in his control room, got everything in its best shape, and soon enough, we were ready to try out a mix. Will we get a mix of Hourglass of Red, or will we just get a test mix of Hourglass of Red? Find out more at 11. It's past 11. Find out more next time. We began playing the 16 track through the Mackie, seeing how far we could get just by adjusting the controls on the board. We gradually patched in the outboard gear, and eventually dialed in the basic tones. How is the bass level? Is ever the bass and the kick sounding? You like where they're sitting? The yeah. Okay. The next step was figuring out our mix moves, all done by hand. As soon as it start, you hear them start like closing. Then the start fading. Then start fading. Yeah. And then do a relatively quick one. It's been common practice for decades to use consoles or software that has what's called automation. That means you can program the console to move faders and switches on its own. So all the moves occur automatically at the final mix but we had no such capabilities. So each pass of a mix essentially became a unique performance. Could you ever stand straight on your own without a crutch? Could you ever hear the words in your ears, in your heart without translation? Eventually, we were happy with the result and decided to mix the rest of the album right there where we recorded it. I didn't know it at the time, but doing that first mix with John was one of the most critical moments making the album. As I've mentioned in our other videos, John had a health scare shortly afterwards, and so he wouldn't be around to complete the album. Well, this wasn't exactly what I had in mind. I was hoping to uh, you know, have a co-pilot for a lot of this stuff, but uh, for the time being, you know, man's gotta do what he's gotta do. I suddenly had a whole new appreciation for doing these mixes there. Uh, this would directly benefit John in his recovery, a blueprint had been set, and it felt appropriate and familiar to work on equipment we've been using for so many years. The sound of the album became a bit softer than I had originally intended, but it felt suitable. I'm not so sure. I spent my first few sessions back at SOS learning the layout of the control room inside and out. That in itself took a while but the real challenge was learning how to use the tape machines. I knew how to push the buttons, but up until this point, John had always been the one to set up, calibrate, and maintain the machines. Thanks to the magic of YouTube and the handy reference manuals at the studio, I was able to figure out most of that within about a week. And then it was back to mixing. I quickly realized it would be impossible to do all the mix moves without a second set of hands, so I called in Tony Caggiano one of our songwriters, to help with the process throughout the rest of the summer. And together we mixed most of the remaining 16 track songs. So to get the solo to where it went, I'm gonna have to lift it a little bit more. Yeah. Max Feinstein also came in to help out on his song, Walking Wounded. If it wasn't this fun, we wouldn't take it so seriously. That summer, we also had the mixes for Weasel and Nomad done by Ernie Indrada at Water Music in Hoboken. Water Music had a beautiful Neve console plus a Studer machine that could play back the 24-track tape. They also had a real plate reverb, which Ernie dialed in on Weasel. But don't have to use an easel. 
One of the greatest functions of digital audio workstations that we take for granted is the ability to splice parts together. It's rudimentary, you can add crossfades, and you can always undo it if you mess up. But when you're working with tape, doing such an edit is a physical and potentially destructive process. You need to cut tape with a razor and then tape the pieces together. We first encountered this mixing our glass of red. There's a mix move at the top of the song that needed to be done a lot of times to get it just right. So, to spare us having to remix the entire song each time, John decided we should just get the intro right, and then splice the section in. We do, but I still I miss this. Actually, I don't miss this. <laughs> Could you ever stand straight on your own without a crutch? That's how it's done, baby. At first, I was pretty terrified of splicing tape on my own, but when the time came to mix more than that, I found myself wanting a combination of two performances that we did. Before splicing the tape, I simulated the edits on the computer to find where these hard cuts would pass undetected. I then mixed the sections from the cassette onto the half-inch tape and carried out four separate splices. Of truth. And it turned out I was pretty good at it. And this was a crucial time to gain that confidence because mixing the title track would call upon everything I'd ever learned about analog mixing, especially the editing process. All the other songs were mixed in a full pass by one or two people, but the title track had just too many changes to pull that off. We had 16 tracks of tape, and at any given moment, um, you know, track 12 or whatever could easily go between Moog effects, and then it's a guitar, and then it's a vocal, and then it's a sound effect again, and then it's a guitar again. You know, there was a whole lot of that going on, a lot of shared We had to estate. share the track real estate because we had so much going yeah. on. Yeah. I had read Ken Scott's book, Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust. Ken was the producer and or engineer on albums by The Beatles, David Bowie, Supertramp, etc. And he wrote about how he used to mix songs in sections. Using that method, I would print, say, one verse and chorus at a time onto the stereo tape. That allowed me to focus on the mix moves for that one section until it was right. Then I could change the settings on the mixing board and do the next section. And if I had to remix something, it generally wouldn't affect the rest of the song, just that one section. Then later, I got out the razor blade and edited the sections together. And how I'm keeping track of how that's all going to actually uh, sound when it's assembled uh, is I'm actually, oh no, I'm using the computer. Uh, it's nowhere in the signal chain whatsoever. Uh, it's, we're still entirely analog here, but I'm actually monitoring uh, through uh, the digital system only because it gives me the chance to actually do the splices in the virtual world. There's not going to be any surprises, basically, when I go to cut all of the different bits together. scary to take a blade to the tape. It's pretty scary. Yeah. There are actually 10 edits, or, or 10 rather separate sections that were joined together. I could have gone and done all these different songs so differently if yeah. I had known that I was capable of doing that. This cut, this one right here, is historic. And I hope I don't f it up. <laughs> So there you have it, the analog mixing process used on Johnny Rock and Friends for the record. After that, it was on to sequencing and mastering. And if you'd like to know more about that process, you can check out our video titled For the Record, All Analog Mastering. I want to quickly say thank you to everyone who's listened to the record and watched our videos these past few years. It's been a while, but we finally got more videos on the way. So uh, please check out our YouTube channel for more music, bios, and equipment vids. We hope you hit subscribe. And for all things Johnny Rock and Friends, go to johnnyrockrecord.com. We'll see you soon. Rock on.